Welcome back, everyone. Military personnel make up less than 1% of the total U.S. population. Uh, just think about the burden. We've talked about this, certainly through the recent conflicts, um, that is being shouldered by a very small portion of our population. And increasingly, anecdotal evidence supports the notion that the people shouldering that burden are coming from lower and lower rungs of the socioeconomic ladder. And I want to bring in Andrew, who's going to help a little bit more with both the history and also the makeup right now of the military. Yeah, Rich, there's not a lot of hard data on this, but studies seem to suggest that the military is increasingly being made up of middle and working class Americans. As one former Marine wrote in the Christian Science Monitor, quote, I can't help concluding that the upper and upper middle or elite social classes seem to be conspicuously absent. An article in the New York Times put it this way, quote, a survey of the American military's endlessly compiled and analyzed demographics paints a picture of a fighting force that is anything but a cross-section of America, with minorities overrepresented and the wealthy and the underclass essentially absent, from, absent with Northeasterners fading from the ranks. America's 1.4 million strong military seems to resemble the makeup of a two-year commuter or trade school outside Birmingham or Biloxi, far from that of a ghetto or a barrio or a four-year university in Boston. While whites account for three of five soldiers, the military has become a powerful magnet for blacks. And increasingly, joining the military is regarded as something of an economic opportunity. Take this man, Specialist Vincent Elliott, for example. He was forced to drop out of college in his freshman year because he was late turning in financial aid forms. He immediately enlisted to get out of town. Quote, there are really no jobs or anything there, he said. I wanted to see something else. It's on that backdrop that three affluent families have decided to take it upon themselves to raise money for military veterans from the wars from Iraq and Afghanistan. They're giving more than a million dollars themselves and asking for donations from other wealthy families whose children did not serve. Their argument is that every non-military family should give something and that the affluent should give large sums. So they launched the Veterans Support Fund, which will funnel money to five organizations already giving medical, financial, and other help to vets and active duty troops. As one of the founders, Jim Stimmel, put it, quote, millions of Americans and their families have sacrificed so much in the conflicts and they have such needs. By contrast, so many affluent Americans have not made a commensurate sacrifice, and they should. Rich? All right, Andrew, and it really got us thinking. Beyond a mandatory military service, a draft here and a return to it, which I don't think there is uh, a sentiment certainly in Washington or even across the country clamoring for, what about a service requirement altogether, whether military or some other sort of service to country? Would that make us better as a nation? And for this, we're joined by retired Lieutenant Colonel Mark Rosen, a man who gave 28 years of his life to service to the military, 18 of those in active duty, including time in Afghanistan. Thank you, as always. I appreciate the time. Um, you know, it, it's funny. My brothers and I keep getting reminded by my father. He goes, you guys missed something by not being in the military. Um, and while he wasn't in wartime, he looks back, at, at his hitch here as one of the best years. He said, I met people I never would have met in this life. He came from a town where there was almost no minorities. It was the first time I got to pe talk to people from not just where he grew up in Mass, but from all different cross sections. And I learned more, and I saw different parts of the country, even the world where he went to. And he said, I know you guys don't think it, but you missed out by not being in it. Forget about why people are getting in right now. It used to be um, and we do a lot with veterans, older veterans, too, where they said there always was somebody on the block that served. You always knew somebody, wherever you were in this country, and they talked proudly about where they were. Now, a lot of people don't know anybody in the military, and there's some towns where everybody's in the military. You live this life. There's something to what I'm saying, right? There's, there's totally something to what you're saying, and the, the feeling of pride and service, the discipline, the hard work, the memories that stay with you for a lifetime and make you a productive citizen downstream. Everyone in the service always has these memories and they recall them. The paradigm of, I think, and the ideal for many of us is uh, World War II. A lot of people came back and the GI Bill was in, in force Greatest and they generation. went out and they found jobs and they're very productive citizens following their service. Then you had the Vietnam War where they, uh, it was a terrible conscription methodology where the elite were allowed to get out of the draft. It, so we went to a volunteer force. It was better than Vietnam, but it does lead to the, uh, a bit of inequities in who's signing up. You'll never get perfect equity. I will also tell you, though, that uh, our military is superb and actually eliminates people who are A, obese, or mm. B, aren't high school grad. So there's an actual whole subset. If you've got a criminal record, forget it. It's actually very competitive. There's folk who'd love to be in the military, but they, because of 
whatever can't get in. And so one of the it's things a the very weird. I've also heard is it's the one place in in America at least where it doesn't matter what uh, your religion is, your ethnicity, your color. You will advance up the ranks depending right. on your ability. It's the one place, forget about lip service, where that actually happens, and you see people of high rank of all Absolutely. different colors. That said, Basil, and I, I spread I, I do my thesis on this and all the rest. A lot of countries, Israel's got mandatory mm -hmm. mi mi military service, mm -hmm. but a lot of European countries, everybody, whether they want to put a uniform on or whether they want to go pick up trash on the highways or go to an underprivileged school to help out or something, everybody's got to give back. Uh, whether they've got you know seven zeros in the bank account here or they're from an inner city with nothing, would that be a good idea? And is that saleable to the public? You know, I'm not sure if um, I'm going to get a lot of pats on the back for saying this, but I do think I do believe in some kind of mandatory service. I really do. Um, it may not be the appropriate democratic thing to say, or but I, I actually do believe in that uh, because I think it creates some cohesion, and I also think it gives you a sense of you know, as you've alluded to, it's who, th you get to meet people, you get to experience um, very hard work, an extraordinary amount of discipline and um, personal responsibility. You um, are, I, I think, interacting w with people in ways that you may never get to do in any other aspect of your life. And I think it, quite frankly, builds character. I'm That's not delusional, I Andrew, to uh, different chapters in American history that we always had stratifications. God knows um, we had slavery in this country, okay? So I'm not trying to paint the good old days, but it does seem with each passing decade, there's more and more stratification. There's the white neighborhoods, the black neighborhoods, the Hispanic neighborhoods. No one's going to bring back busing in this country or whatever else. At least if there was some service, we could at least have some exposure. You can you can have lives now in this country where you never have to deal with anybody of a different background than you, potentially. And we're seeing the graphs, as we talk about, with have and have nots getting wider and wider. I think it's in the national interest to do this. But again, this would take away well, a person's 12, 18 months here where they get to just say, no, I don't want to do anything if I want to be... Uh, a a uh, patriotic or whatever you want a country, I don't have to be. I don't think national service would uh, would close the gaps in the haves and the have-nots. And, and I think in much the way that, that military service or being drafted uh, and shared military experience sort of got people to experience other portions of the country or other people in the country that they hadn't met before, I think college more and more is serving that role. I, I would prefer an incentivized, encouraged national service program, maybe a GI Bill sort that... that you know, you could qualify for a discount on college or, or you do perhaps realize, a, a, a though, cheap that if loan. that's the case, if there's a money component to it, you definitely are going to write off the top end of this country that's going to have nothing to do um, with the program because they don't need the money. Um, I'm trying to say, again, in other parts of this world, in other westernized nations, it doesn't matter how big your bank account is. Everybody's got to pitch in. It was the point of those three families here yeah, uh, but, that but are writing the checks. Going back to when we had compulsor, uh, compulsory, uh, mili no, not military service, but the draft uh, was certainly in place, you still had you know, wealthy families who figured out an end and around. To Mark's a, point, around. I think if we had a time where you eliminated that, um, it would make people also think twice about sending somebody else's kid to war if their own kid was going there. Well, it would have to really be worse. I, I, I think no, the you national service them. idea is an economic growth mm -hmm. imperative and a national security imperative. We have a th almost 13% unemployment with the youth right now. That's a problem. We need to encourage the growth of basic skills. How do you become a productive citizen who knows their history, who can work hard and learn new skills on the job? We can do a lot with that.